This tape is designed to assist in the setup, use, and maintenance of HCE type mass comparators. All models in the HCE series, from 5 kilogram capacity up to 100 kilograms, are similarly designed. Therefore, these instructions can be used for any of these models. HCE balances represent the state of the art in industrial and scientific measurement. Each model in the series has a capacity to sensitivity ratio of 10 million to 1, yet they are rugged and easy to use. Balances in the HCE series are widely used as mass comparators, bullion scales, and for the preparation of precision gas mixtures. The instruction manual contains all of the basic setup and operation information, but has limited maintenance material. The cover page indicates the capacity, sensitivity, and range of the weighing chain. In most cases, the ratio of capacity to sensitivity is 10 million to 1. For example, in the case of the 100 model HCE100, the capacity is 100 kilograms and the sensitivity is 10 milligrams. After the balance has been received and the box inspected for possible damage, open the outer crate. which must be assembled to the balance are fastened within the outer crate. Remove the glass crate. Remove the hangers, both front and rear. Go ahead. that each of the hangers is marked to identify left and right. Two dots is right and one dot is left. The small parts box which is attached to the hanger should be removed and set aside. Remove the beam cradle by removing the nuts which lock the threaded rods onto the base. This must be done on both the front and back of the skid. Before removing the cradle, note that the pointer at the end of the beam must not be damaged in removing, so just be careful in removing this entire cradle. the nuts at the bottom of the threaded rods and pull the four threaded rods out from the frame. This will permit the upper cradle to be removed.
Again, be careful not to damage the black point on the end of the rod. Remove the clamps on the damper rods. And carefully remove the beam from the cradle, but observe the thread on the end of the two rods. Care must be taken not to damage that thread. A site for the location of the balance should be chosen, which is free of vibration, drafts, and temperature changes. Avoid locations near windows where sunlight could fall on the balance. Traffic should be limited around the balance during measurement. Remove all visible packing material. Remove the top and the front panel which can be removed by sliding it out of its track. Remove all of the internal packing material, including ties and the wooden clamps which support the arrestment mechanism. Drum, make sure that the chain which is suspended from the drum is not twisted or damaged. Remove the clamps which hold the pan arrest, the beam arrest in place. Remove all dust and accumulated packing debris from the inside of the balance case. Wipe the center bearing with a soft cloth to remove fingerprints and dust. Dust the leveling legs until the spirit level on the upper support frame is centered. After leveling, lock the safety nuts to prevent the balance from changing its position. Remove the screws which attach the inner panel to the right frame of the cabinet and put the panel aside. Carefully remove all packing material from the beam. When removing the paper strips around the knife edges, take care not to damage the knives.
dust the beam and wipe the knife edges with a soft cloth. Orient the beam so that the chain bearing assembly is to the right. You are now facing the front of the beam. Take note of the detector pin projecting down from the rod at the center of the beam. Open the magnets on both sides of the balance. Arrest the beam by turning the handle to the down position. Note the three arrest points on the arrest arm here, here, and the third one is screw over on the right end. It is on these points that the beam will be placed. Note that the detector vane must be directly in the slot of the detector assembly. Close the magnets. In order that we can operate the meter with the beam in the arrested position, go behind the panel and place some insulating material against the micro switch so that it will remain in the closed position. This is the normal operating position. The cord and turn the power switch to on. The next few steps will center the detector pin in the detector assembly. First, set the zero knob to approximately the center of its range. Do the same with the calibrate knob. Now observe the position of the meter pointer. If it is not at zero, readjust the position of the detector assembly until the pointer is centered. Observe the meter reading. If the pointer is not centered, it is necessary to readjust the position of the detector assembly until it is centered. This can be accomplished by loosening the lock screws underneath the center support and adjusting until the meter reads approximately zero. Release the beam and gently rock the beam to the limits of, the, of its movement. Observe the pointer on the meter, making sure that it moves equally to both ends of the scale. Arrest the beam and remove the material which is holding the micro switch in place so that it can now operate normally. The box containing the rest of the small parts can now be opened. Included are two stirrups or suspensions from which the sample pans are hung. Remove 
the packing material from the stirrups. Note that the stirrups are marked with one dot for left and two dots for right. The box also contains an envelope containing the weighing chain. Put this envelope aside for now. Wipe the stirrups clean and remove any fingerprints from the stirrup bearing with a soft cloth. Hold the left stirrup marked with one dot with the hook facing forward and thread it over the left knife edge, avoiding contact with the edge. Then lower it into place with the support points in the sockets. Assemble the right stirrup in the same way. Look closely at the left stirrup between the knife edge and the bearing with a white card held behind. You should see a small space. As you release the beam, the space should disappear. You will want to look for two things. First of all, that the space is approximately 10 thousandths wide. And secondly, that as you slowly release it, both ends of the knife come in contact with the bearing at the same time. The same test should be performed on the right hand knife. Locate the front of the knife edge and observe that when the beam is released, the knife edge and the bearing separate. This separation should also be approximately 10 thousandths of an inch. Replace the side panel. Clean the left hand. Note that the left hand has one dot. Hang the left hand from the left hook by swinging the pan forward Push the pan arrest down to allow the pan to swing into place. Repeat with the right pan. Look beneath the pans to observe that both pan arrest pins are touching the bottom of their respective pans. 
adjust either pin as necessary. Remove the chain weight from the envelope. It is wrapped on a card. Carefully remove the chain from the card, being careful not to twist or stretch the chain. Holding the chain by one end, run your fingers down gently to make sure that there are no twists in the chain. Observe that at each end of the chain, there is a different fitting. The flat stainless steel fitting will be placed over the spear-shaped bearing on the beam. The diamond-shaped wire is suspended from the hook on the chain drum. Make sure that there are no twists in the chain after the assembly has been completed. Test the chain weight drive by rotating the knob on the front panel. Rotate the knob so that the zero shows on the digital display. Then rotate the knob to bring the display to 100. Observe the chain weight to be sure that it moves smoothly during this operation from 0 to 100. Finally, reset the knob to read 0. Replace the front panel. And replace the top. The top is correctly assembled when the molding seam along the top, along the edge of the top, is at the rear of the balance. The balance is now ready for use. For purposes of clarity, the glass windows will not be installed during this demonstration. However, they should be unpacked and placed in the slots, each glass in its own slot, with finger holes out at the outer edges so that the door. The next section covers the maintenance of HCE balances. We will cover four topics. The first will be a theoretical review of the principles of operation of this type of instrument. We will then review routine preventive maintenance, which might be done on a monthly basis, perhaps. This will be followed by a section covering more detailed inspection of the instrument 
It might be done on a semi-annual or perhaps annual basis. Finally, we can cover some troubleshooting that might be done as problems occur. This section as a whole should enable the user to provide uninterrupted operation of the balance for many years without requiring factory service. The HCE instruments are examples of very high precision equal arm balances. Let's examine what we mean by an equal arm balance. If we have a lever with three pivots, one in the center, one on each end, and we put a mass on each on the end of each lever, we can take a look at the equilibrium situation. If the torque, which is the length of the arm times the force on it, L1 times M1 equals L2 times M2, for equilibrium, we can compute M1 as being equal to M2 times the ratio of the two arms. If, in fact, L1 and L2 are identically equal, then M equals M2 times exactly 1, or M1 equals M2. In the case of an instrument with a resolution of one part in 10 million, the ratio of L2 to L1 would have to be equal to one part in 10 million in order to be able to use the balance as a direct reading instrument. That is, where if you put samples on M1 and weights on M2, you could assume that the value of M1 is equal to the value of M2. In fact, this is not practical since in an arm length of 12 inches or so, the ratio would have to be within 1.2 micro inches. As a practical matter, the ratio can be adjusted to within about five parts per million. Therefore, weighing techniques must be used which allow for this ratio. However, in order to obtain precision, that is reproducibility, and to obtain this precision within one part in 10 million, we must examine the construction of a balance which will allow for this precision. Therefore, let us examine various types of construction of equal arm balances. We have shown here rudimentary pivots of uh, perhaps cylinders. The precision of this type is quite low and in fact would not make a practical instrument used for any kind of a decent measurement. The first type of instrument which will provide reasonable precision is that using knife edges. If we have three knife edges and use V-shaped bearings, that is bearings which can sit in place on the knife edge, we have a type of structure which will hold together, that is the bearings will not fall off the knives, and we can place samples on the pans and obtain the precision can you see the knife edges yeah. Yeah. then uh, you can make a reasonable measurement however as we'll see later there is a limitation on the precision with which we can hold the ratio of these arms in order to hold a very precise ratio we have to be able to first define the length of the arm if the distance from this knife edge to this knife edge is not carefully defined by the structure, then it will become variable during the measurement. And therefore, the ratio of L2 to L1 will become a variable. The limitation of a V-type bearing construction is about one part in 10,000, or perhaps a little better. This type of construction, when properly made, is very superior because now the lever ratio can be sharply defined. If we look at the knife edge in contact with a flat bearing, we can see that the distance is measured merely between the knife edges and is virtually independent of the bearings. This type of construction is used on the HCE-10. However, with this type of construction, since there is no means for holding this knife in place against the bearing, that is, the bearing conceivably could slide off of the knife edge, another structure is required 
which is called the arrestment. And its function is to hold the knives and bearings in their proper locations. On the HCE type balances, the arrestment is this structure in here, which is underneath the lever. The end knives are covered by the end bearings, which are contained in this housing. If the arrestment is operated, you can see that the arm drops a small amount as I go up and down. When it's up, the knives are separated from the bearings, and when it's down, the knives are located very precisely on the bearings. Returning to the question of parallel, of the ratio of the arm length, let's consider what the beam looks like as we look down from the top. This is the center knife edge, and these are the end knife edges. I've shown them in an exaggerated way with one of the knife edges not parallel to the center. Now, if we want to consider the ratio of L1 to L2, where are we to measure it? If we were to measure it here, out of this ratio, we would have one ratio. If we were to measure it here, we would have a considerably different ratio. And if, in fact, we're trying to make a measurement of a part in 10 million, we must have some assurance that the ratio is fixed and reproducible. Now, how would it come about that we would have to measure it one place or another? Well, it depends on how the load is applied to the knife. If the load is effectively applied towards this end of the knife, we would get the longer arm, the longer lever. If, we're, if it were to be applied at this end of the knife, we would, have get, we would get the shorter lever. Ideally, we would want a construction where L1 is equal to L2 at all points along the knife edge. In fact, there is a practical limit to how closely this adjustment can be made. It is made very precisely. However, on the model HCE types, which are extraordinarily high precision balances, we, we provide an additional effect of applying, effectively applying the load to the center of the knife, no matter where it is applied to the pan. And we can look at this on the balance. An additional device is included in the suspension of the balance, which provides a knife edge at right angles to the knife edge on which the weighing is performed. And if you notice that as I press this, the suspension is pivoting on this additional knife edge. The effect of this knife edge is to apply the load to the center of the knife, no matter where the load is actually placed on the pan. An additional degree of freedom is provided by another knife edge system at the bottom of the suspension, which provides another degree of freedom for the application of the load. All of these elements in combination provide for a very high reproducibility of the effective arm length, and therefore it becomes a very reproducible uh, quantity, all of which leads to a very high precision in this type of equipment. Returning to the simplified beam, sensitivity is defined as the unbalanced load on one pan required to move the beam to a given angle. The higher the sensitivity, the less force required. Since the force required is that required to raise the center of gravity, it should be apparent that if we raise the center of gravity, we can increase the sensitivity. Or conversely, if we lower the center of gravity, we can lower the sensitivity. But how much can we raise this sensitivity? Consider the balance beam to be, in effect, a wheel which can rotate on a central axis. If the weight is evenly distributed around the wheel, and if we rotate the wheel into, through any angle, it will remain in its new position. This is called neutral equilibrium. If we add a weight to one of the spokes, gravity will cause the wheel to rotate down until the weight is in its lowest position, that is, nearest the Earth. 
in fact, if there's very little friction in the center of the pivot, if we were to place this weight on, on here, it would oscillate a number of times and finally find an equilibrium position. This is stable to equilibrium or oscillatory equilibrium. If we were to add a second weight to the wheel, the wheel would rotate to find a new position where the component of the force between the earth and that weight was at equilibrium. And again, this wheel would oscillate about this position until friction were finally to allow it to come to some new position. Again, neutral equilibrium. In erasing the board, I realized that the last statement was that it was a condition of neutral e equilibrium. In fact, it was a condition of stable equilibrium. But let's look at a third type of equilibrium. If we have the same wheel and place a weight on the vertical spoke and just balance it there, it might sit there, but any slight push would cause the weight to try to fall to the bottom, either direction. In other words, it cannot oscillate around this position. It is considered then to be unstable equilibrium. And we will consider these various types of equilibrium when we discuss the beam of a precision balance. We have shown a beam structure here where the plane of the end knives is in an exaggerated way below the plane of the center knife. And let's observe what happens as we apply load to this beam. Presumably, we can adjust the center of gravity by means of some trimming weight until it is in such a position that we obtain the sensitivity that we require. And this would be true with the empty pan. Now, as we add a weight to the pan, this effectively pulls the center of gravity towards the knife edge. And the more weight we add to the pan, the closer it comes to the knife edge. The result is that the center of gravity is being lowered from the center knife, and the sensitivity is falling. This is a very co common kind of construction where, in fact, it may even be required that the sensitivity be a function of the load. That is, as the load is increased, the sensitivity goes down. For a very high precision balance, this is not a good arrangement. And as you, as you will see, we, we adjust the knife edges in a different way in order to provide the kind of constant sensitivity that's required for precision balance. Here is another possible configuration where the plane of the end knives is above the center knife. Again, by means of trimming weights, we can place the center of gravity where we, we require it for the empty pans. But then, as we add weight to the pans, the center of gravity will migrate towards the, the plane of the end knives. And you could observe that as the center of gravity goes up, the sensitivity increases. But in fact, it could come above the center knife. Remembering our wheel with the weight at the top, we would have a condition of unstable equilibrium. And the beam, in fact, instead of being able to oscillate, would flop one way or the other. For a balance of high precision, where we require that the sensitivity be, remain constant with load, it is necessary to put the three knife edges in the same plane. Therefore, again, as we adjust the center of gravity to give us the sensitivity re that we require, a change in the load will not change the position of the center of gravity since it's already established at the three knife edges. This is the type of construction which is used on the HCE models, and it is possible to adjust these knife edges in such a way that we maintain a very, very close uh, sensitivity as a function of the load. However, since the beam isn't made of any, an elastic material, that is, it can bend under the load, the fact is that the plane of the knives is set slightly higher than the center knife. And thus, as the beam bends uh, with increasing load, the sensitivity tends to fall back to the uh, original value. In fact, the curve then becomes a curve 
like this, where this is load, and this is sensitivity. Returning to the question of increasing the, seven, the sensitivity by raising the center of gravity, it should be pointed out that as the center of gravity becomes very close to the knife edge, the period of oscillation lengthens, requiring a longer time to make a measurement. Also, as the CG approaches the center pivot, the effect of temperature on the location of the CG becomes very striking and small changes in temperature can cause changes in the position of the CG due to changes in dimension of the beam itself. And the effect of this is to cause variability in the, in the reading. In the HCE series, the CG is put rather low. That is, it has a relatively low mechanical sensitivity. And then by magnifying the displacement of the beam, we bring the sensitivity back up to the value that is required. Two things are accomplished by this. First of all, the period of oscillation, that is the time that it takes the beam to oscillate around its equilibrium position, is greatly shortened. And the time required to make a measurement is thereby shortened. Secondly, the, be the system becomes very stable because the temperature effects are extremely minimized. Now, when we use a magnification of this, dis of this angle that is being measured, it is necessary that the rest of the balance be very properly constructed. That is, the knife edges and the bearings become a very important function in the precision of the system. And in the case of the HCE series, the bearings themselves are optically flat. The knife edges are the intersection of two optical flats. The arrestment mechanism is very precisely made so that the knife edges and bearings are restored to the same position each time a measurement is made. It is by this method that the precision of the HCE series is achieved. Several other devices are used on the HCE series balances. A magnetic damper is used to determine the equilibrium position of the beam instead of allowing it to oscillate. This saves considerable time in making a measurement. Since the magnetic damper consists of a non-magnetic vein, in this case aluminum, passing between a fixed magnetic flux field provided by two magnets on each end of the balance, it is a, becomes a velocity device. That is, as the vein passes through the magnetic field, eddy currents are created, and the each eddy current has around it a magnetic force which is opposite to the force of the fixed field. And this causes the, the vein and in turn the beam to look for an equilibrium position. Since it is a velocity device, there is no force at the equilibrium position because the velocity at that point is zero. Another device which is supplied with this series is a chain weight which consists of a chain wrapped around a drum. The drum can be rotated, adding weight to the chain, which in turn is added to the beam. Therefore, we have a continuously variable weight. The control of the chain is through a knob on the front panel. And you can observe that as the knob is rotated, not only is the chain dropped, but a counter is synchronized with it, and the entire system is calibrated to read directly in weight units. The purpose of the chain weight is to eliminate the need for the handling of small weights, which otherwise would have to be applied to the pan when bringing the sample weight into equilibrium. And therefore, it is a convenience and provides another time-saving element in the use of this high-precision weighing device. A final additional device is located beneath the pan of the balance, and this is the pan damper. It is a gravi gravity operated device whose function is to allow the pan to return to equilibrium after it has been disturbed by the addition of a weight. The effect is that when the beam is released, the pans will not be swinging, and therefore 
central forces will not be applied to the knife edges. This again is a means for providing a higher precision measurement. Regular maintenance can, present, can prevent or at least stave off the need for major repairs. High precision balances as represented by the HCE series usually succumb to damage or improper use rather than wearing out, particularly if maintained in a regular way. This section deals with the relatively frequent inspection which might be performed to ensure continuing good operation. The first item refers to cleaning of the balance. Dusty or dirty environments will cause excessive wear on a number of balance parts. Keep the balance clean either by frequently dusting with a soft brush, particularly around the knife edges and bearings, and also the pickup points, or by vacuuming in the same area. Start the dusting at the top by removing the front panel and gradually work down to the base. Magnetic particles can accumulate on the surface of the magnets. Open the magnets and clean them with masking tape. In some environments, combinations of gaseous chemicals can cause solid deposits on balance parts. Wipe with a soft cloth, but be careful about wiping knife edges with other than non-abrasive materials. Lint-free lens tissue is acceptable as a wiping material. Solvents should be avoided as they may change the finish, damage the finish of some parts. Alcohol may be used on bearings, but wipe carefully to remove any residue. Regular lubrication should not be performed on the balance. All of the bearings are pre-lubricated and fittings which are visible should not have additional grease or oil applied to them. For all practical purposes, the balance is lubricated for life and the addition of additional lubric lubricants could conceivably cause difficulty by the application in the wrong parts of the instrument. The balance sits on four leveling screws and it is generally useful to maintain the balance in a level condition because out of level can change the zero point. Care should be taken that all four screws are touching the table on which the balance sits. Otherwise, the balance could be subject to tilt, which could, leave, could, which could lead to erratic readings. There are several routine tests that can be performed to ensure that the balance is operating correctly. Included among these is the zero point, and that is whether the mechanical zero and the electrical zero are within normal ranges. In addition, a check of the sensitivity will give some indication as to possible wear of knife edges. The calibration of the chain weight is another test which can be performed to ensure continuing accuracy. When maintaining the zero position of the balance, attempts should be made to keep the zero adjustment in the center of its range. There are approximately 10 graduations of zero adjustment on the electrical zero. And by setting the mechanical zero in the center of the electrical zero range, it will be possible to have approximately the same number of graduations on either side of the zero point. This mechanical adjustment can be made merely by adjusting one of the balancing nuts on the end of the beam. A check of the sensitivity is an indication of possible excessive wear of the knife edges. As the knives wear, the plane of the end knives will drop below that of the center knife, causing a lowering of the center of gravity and a corresponding lowering of sensitivity. As a check, we begin by zeroing the balance.
we place a small weight on the pan The size of the weight we use for convenience would be a standard weight whose value is equal to 20 times the sensitivity. In the case of the HCE05, which is being used in this demonstration, the sensitivity is rated at 0 0.5 milligrams, and therefore we are using a 10 milligram weight for the test weight. Observe that the deflection from the zero point is sixth division on the scale. This would be the normal sensitivity adjustment for a balance of this type. The limit would be from five to six graduations. A further test would be to place the same weight on the opposite pan observe the deflection in the opposite direction. The combined, the combined number of the graduations of deflection should be between 10 and 12. In this case, it is six divisions to the right of zero and therefore is equal to 12 graduations which would be the normal maximum to which the sensitivity would be set. Normally the sensitivity should be checked at several loads and a test which we will perform later will give an indication of the plane of the knives which will be affected by possible wear in the knife edges and will show up as a change in sensitivity with load. The calibration of the chain consists of comparing the weight of the chain to a standard weight. We begin by zeroing the balance with both pans empty. The indication on the chain dial should be all zeros exactly to the zero mark. We now place a standard weight equal to the full scale of the chain. In the case of this balance, one gram. It is placed on the left pan. And the chain drive is operated until it reads exactly 100, which is the full scale range of the chain. We then observe the indication on the meter. If the chain were correctly adjusted, the pointer would again return to zero. In this case, since the pointer is to the right of zero, it's an indication that the chain itself is effectively heavier than the standard weight. In order to correct this, we must change the position at which the chain hangs on the beam. In order to correct the fact that the chain apparently weighs more than the standard weight, it's going to be necessary to move the chain bearing slightly closer to the center knife. This is done by first loosening the lock screw and then rotating the spear, in this case, 
rotating it so that it moves slightly closer to the center knife, tightening the lock screw, and then retesting. However, the adjustment of this bearing, because it has a weight hanging from it, is also going to check, is also going to cause a change in the zero point. So it will be necessary to re-zero the balance before rechecking the calibration. Having made the adjustment on the chain bearing, it is necessary then to readjust one of the balancing weights in order to bring the balance back into equilibrium. Having done that, and perhaps trying more than once, we can recheck the calibration by again returning the chain to read zero with the pan empty, release the beam, Make sure the pointer is reading zero. We then place a one gram weight, or 10 gram as the case may be, depending on the model of the balance, on the pan. And adjust the chain out to its full reading. and observe the pointer. When correctly adjusted, it will again be exactly on the zero mark. This completes the calibration of the chain. There are several points of mechanical inspection that would be useful on a regular basis. They would be the photo detector to make sure that the detector vane is properly centered, the main arrestment mechanism to make sure that it is functioning without backlash, the chain drive which controls the weighing chain, and correct operation of the pan damper. It should be necessary from time to time to check the position of the photo detector, that is the position of the vane within the detector area. This vein should be approximately centered on the photo detector, and this can be checked easily, as was done in the original installation, by looking at the effect on the electric meter. After the balance has been zeroed, the beam should be released, and the beam gently moved up and down within the limits of its travel. When moved through this distance, the pointer on the null meter should travel full scale. This should be done very carefully so as not to disturb the relationship of the knives and bearings during the, mo the movement of the beam. The arrestment consists of a lever which through two drive chains operates two camshafts these camshafts operate in ball bearings and contain within the framework ball, eccentric ball bearings which operate against the arrestment arms. As the handle is rotated, the arms are raised and lowered 
a very small amount. This amount is just sufficient for the beam to travel properly in the photo detector. Correct operation requires that the knife edges and bearings be separated during the operation. You will note that you can see the space change between the suspension. In this case, the knives and bearings are in contact with each other and the beam is free to move. This is the re release position. In the arrest position, the space is removed and no motion can be made in the beam. The only place to look for possible service would be in the case of backlash in the chain, there is behind the frame, which can be accessed by removing the rear panel, a turnbuckle, which can be used to tighten the chain if required. The weighing chain mechanism consists of a chain drive between the knob through a pair of sprockets behind this panel up to a main sprocket on the shaft onto which the chain drum is attached. Note that as I rotate the drum, as the handle, the drum rotates either raising or lowering the chain. The only service point on this mechanism could be the tension in this chain. It should be relatively tight but not taut and can be adjusted by means of adjustable pulleys which are behind the, this side panel. It is rare that such adjustment need be made but it can be made if necessary. The adjustment for tension in this chain is on this framework which is held in place by a screw underneath difficult to show on the camera. In order to adjust the tension, the screw is loosened and this entire frame can be moved backwards which will increase the tension on the chain. For clarity, we have removed the pans in order to observe the operation of the pan arrest. The pan arrest itself consists of a weighted bar onto which two fingers are attached. Notice that the weight of the bar in the back is what causes the pressure of the pan damper on the pan itself. The arrestment for this mechanism is also behind the panel and consists of a can which is operated by the beam arrestment. It is synchronized so that the pans are released at the very last moment. So the, the shaft is now in the arrested position. As we go towards the release position, first the beam is released, and then finally the pan is released. The adjustment of the length of the screw controls the amount of motion. Since the motion is very small, and in fact is not critical, it is not usually necessary to adjust the screw. However, sometimes the arrestment bar itself, which is mounted on a pivot, may come off the pivot and would have to be replaced. It is merely two pointed screws. In addition to the tests we have discussed previously, there are several which could be performed at less frequent intervals. These tests will help monitor long term wear or damage. Included are the lever ratio, that is the relative lengths of the two lever arms. Secondly, the parallelism of the end knives with respect to the center knives. And finally, the precision or reproducibility of the instrument. The tools which will be required for these procedures include two weights near the capacity, equal to 
or nearly equal to the capacity of the balance. Two weights which have hooks on them, which enable us to apply the load to each end of the knife, and some small weights of known value. The two weights, in this case, we're going to use three kilogram weights for a five kilogram balance, should be very nearly equal in weight, but the actual values are not important. This is also true for the hook weights. It is more important they, that, they be, be, that they be approximately equal in weight rather than adjusted to any particular value. When a balance is newly adjusted, the lever ratio is adjusted very close to unity. With both wear and time, the ratio will change, but usually will remain within acceptable limits for many years. In any event, the ratio is of little consequence since all methods of measurement using precision equal arm balances eliminate the effect of this ratio. However, for purposes of monitoring possible deterioration, a measure of the ratio can be useful. In testing the equality of the lever arm, we normally would follow good weighing procedure. For the purposes of clarity in this demonstration, we are leaving the front panel off of the balance. The first step after placing the weights inside the balance to allow them to come to thermal equilibrium with the balance is to zero beam is arrested and we place the test weights on the pan. Again, release the beam. And observe the rest point. It is useful to know the value of this displacement in weight units. So in this case, let us use the chain mechanism. To bring the pointer back to zero. In this case, it's exactly 20 milligrams. Again, we arrest the beam. Now we have a concern as to whether the two weights are actually of equal value. In order to eliminate the possibility that they are not, or at least to find out whether or not they are, we will reverse the weights on the pan. Again, we release the beam. If the weights were identical in weight to each other, we would get the same rest point we had on the previous weighing.
In this case, the rest point is deflected to the left, which means the weight which is now on the right is the heavier of the two weights. And the true rest point, if the weights had been equal, would be between the two points that we had measured. Since they are fairly close together, it will not be necessary at this time to make any correction. But we can now compute the approximate arm length ratio. Examining the results in the first measurement, we had a zero reading, that is the beam was in equilibrium with the pointer at zero. In the second, when we put M1 on the left and M2 on the right, we arrived at a reading of 20 milligrams with the indication that it was the right hand that was heavier. In other words, M2 was heavier than M1. When we reversed the weights, we got an indication of approximately five milligrams. Sorry, that's five milligrams to the left. which is the rest point that would have been obtained if the two weights had been identically equal. Therefore, the difference in the rest point represents, is represented by the difference from the zero reading in the first instance to the rest point which we would have had if the two weights were equal. And this comes to a, an indication of 15 milligrams. Therefore, going, since, since we, did, we reversed the weights, the rest point would have been in between the two weights, that is the two indications. Therefore, we divide this 15 milligrams by two to get, get 7.5 milligrams, and therefore we had an, a ratio error of 7.5.